So this uh, is the Web APIs with our book club uh, with the data science learning community. And I am John Harmon and I am writing this book. Uh, and today we're gonna talk about processing other response types. Um, I'll get to the learning objectives in a second, but the idea here is like originally this chapter was all about all of the processing of responses. Um, and logically we've done a lot of that already. We've, uh, we can process JavaScript or JSON objects or YAML um, and unnest them and like deal with all that. Uh, and so, and it, it just made sense to pull that out of this chapter. We want, we need to be able to do that before we can do much of anything. But then this chapter is okay. Now, if you have something other than uh, nested JSON, how do you deal with that? Uh, so uh, it's divided up into three major sections. Um, we wanna be able to parse text responses other than JSON, so other types of text responses. And technically we're gonna do a little bit of a JSON review inside of that too. Um, we wanna be able to parse binary responses such as images and videos um, or anything else like a file that a, an API might send you. And we wanna deal with error responses. So um, we'll learn a little bit about the different types of errors that you might get and how you can deal with those. Um, on this one, both uh, from you know you here, Kevin, and anyone else watching, uh, I really want to hear some feedback about how deep this coverage can should go because each of these topics almost could be a book on its own, um, and so I want to see what you think about um, the level that I went with. So before we can. Um, get into parsing these different content content types. I want to talk a little bit about what what the heck content types mean. So John, sorry, could I ask you a yeah, question? Um sure. what, what is the name of this chapter again? Sorry, that slipped my mind. It's uh process other response types. Oh, okay. Thanks. I so that is one thing that I've changed on everything. The, they have these have all been questions and just it made it a little long. So imagine like how can I <laughs> on the on the start of pretty much every chapter. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're kind of like, what task do you want to do? I want to be able to process other response types. So that's what we're going to do. All right. Um, so we've been, you know, we've seen how to get responses back with it or two um, in various ca use cases. And in this, um, when you get that response back, it has a header on it, content type. Um, you'll often see this described as the MIME type of the response. That is an old internet abbreviation for multi-purpose internet mail extensions. And it's just, uh, it started with like, what could email attachments contain were these different MIME types. Uh, but now it's just general, um, a way to tag content to tell people what what you're meaning to send, what you were intending this, this content to be. Uh, that is designated as a type slash subtype semicolon. And then you can have uh, comma separated list of parameter equals value, uh, key value pairs. Um, for example, actually, I don't have an example here like I should. We'll see the examples in a moment, but that might be like um, text slash HTML. And then the semicolon would have uh, the encoding equals UTF-8 or some other weird encoding. Um, about that again in a second. So, okay, first off, there's hitter two response uh, content type, resp content type can tell you the type slash subtype that comes back. And then uh, hitter two resp encoding gets the char set parameter. So that'd be the, what I was saying that char set equals uh, UTF-8 or Latin one or various other things. I wanted to call that out specifically because if you're getting, uh, especially if you're hitting kind of an old API and you're getting weird characters like empty squares or or just you know random other alphabet uh, characters, that is a good sign that probably they're sending it back in a weird encoding and you need to uh, deal with processing that a little bit. Um, there are more about these at MDN MIME types. That's the Mozilla Developer Network uh, page all about MIME types and even more linked out from there, the uh, Internet Assigned Numbers Authority Media Types Registry. That's like the official list of MIME types. Um, 
something important to know about these, like I, you're not as likely to see this, but um, as with kind of everything we've talked about, the API is telling you this information about what MIME type it's sending. And they could be doing something weird and like have a typo in their MIME type or that kind of thing. And so you have to kind of, you have to work with it. You can't just auto detect what they say it is and say, oh, that's got to be correct because they can be wrong. Um, and so I'm not going to just be showing you this is the uh, standard that this is exactly how it should be because yeah, it might be how it should be, but it's not necessarily how it is. And we'll talk a little bit about kind of how to recognize the different types. So we're going to start with the text content types. Um, like I said, we've been working with uh, what will normally be seen as application slash JSON. We'll see on the later slides that uh, each of these can have different tags. Even if everyone's doing everything right, they could have slightly different tags that they're using to identify things. Um, that type is parsed with REST body JSON. We've worked with that uh, in several previous chapters at this point. It's by far the most common right now on the internet for APIs. Um, Probably next most common is application slash XML. You can parse that with REST body XML. That was the most common. There was like XML came out as this uh, new standard that is going to, everything is going to be XML from now on. And then I think JSON came not that long after that. And everyone's like, oh no, that's a better new standard. We're going to go with that. Um, another one you'll see is text slash HTML. And again, that can also have different names or different ways of being designated. Press that with rest body HTML. This is really just a subclass of XML. We'll talk a little bit about that, that technically XML is a super class of HTML because it was designed uh, to be kind of an add-on. Um, I don't, so technically YAML is a subclass of JSON or a super class of JSON, uh, but it, I, um, I don't have it handy here. It's probably application slash YAML is how that one comes back, but also usually it'll come back as a .yaml file in the, like the URL be, will be .yaml. And uh, you, um, I haven't tried it, but I think REST body JSON will almost always work with JSON or with YAML as well. Um, but you also might, if you have something weird, like the YAML might come back as text plain, and then you just parse it with REST body string and then parse it as YAML. So that's, this is kind of the catch-all for any other formats that this text might be coming back in. Um, you might be getting text back as a CSV. And in that case, you would just probably parse it as text plain, pull that, that text out as is, and then parse it with uh, read CSV or anything like that. And so the same thing would work for YAML. Um, I can't remember what we have done on past uh, past slides, so I'll have to make sure I add that back in. All right, uh, JSON, again, this slide and the next one um, might be entirely covered in an earlier chapter. I'm bringing it back up here as um, partly as a review, but partly because I don't think we've gone over this formally and I wanna make sure I have it logged somewhere, even if I end up moving it. Um, uh, so, I have, so the question in the chat is, have you ever encountered syntax issues with the claimed content type, like missing a bracket or something in the response content? Um, yes, I have seen, um, you know, the, like they'll have bad JSON or uh, a CSV that's missing a column in one place or something like that. Um, in those cases, that's where this rest body string comes in and you can just pull it in as pure text. And then you're dealing with it as if you had a text file on your machine and doing whatever you might do to fix that. So you can like edit that response that comes back and make it valid or whatever you might have to do to work with it at that point. All right, so on, on JSON responses, um, again, that's application slash JSON, various like it could come back as text slash JSON, even though that's not a, technically a valid format. Um, and there are some things that are, that will be like uh, subclasses of JSON. So there's special types of JSON that will come back. Um, REST body JSON, which is under the hood using JSON Lite from JSON, as we saw way back in uh, like chapter two. 
but we never did, I don't think, formally talk about what is JSON data? Like what, what does it look like? What does it contain? Uh, JSON has four scalars. So kind of these are their atomic types uh, similar to length one vectors in R. They have null, which is kind of NA, kind of null. It's They only have the one type of missing data. Sorry. <clears throat> they have strings, which are length one character vectors. Um, it's all we, you always use quotes in JSON for strings, not single quotes, but double quotes. They have numbers, which again are kind of like a length one numeric. So if they don't have uh, infinity or negative infinity, like we have in R and they don't have NAN, they just have the one type of missing, sorry, that one type of missing. <clears throat> and then they have Boolean, which again is like a length one logical, uh, lowercase true or in lowercase false or true and false. I'm so sorry. Mm. All right, and then they have two more types that are um, kind of list or vector-like. So they have arrays, which are somewhat like uh, or unnamed lists. They can contain any of those scalar atomic types. Um, they're designated with square brackets, and you can see here that you know, like if it's a list or an, sorry, an array of null, a, one, and true, that's kind of like a list, or that would be translated to list null a one true um, in JSON Lite. Uh, from JSON, if the thing that comes back here is all of one of these types um, and you have the parameter set the way it is by default, uh, it will turn that into a vector. So if it's a list, but they're all the same type of thing, then it says, okay, I'll make that a vector. They also have objects, which are basically named lists. Those are in uh, curly braces. And so it's um, you know a string. So it's the, you know, a the name in quotes, and then the object or the um, element, the the contents of that piece. And I just wanted to point out that these can be arrays. Um, arrays can also, uh, actually, I don't. Arrays cannot contain arrays, but objects can can contain arrays, or they contain can contain other objects. Um, and actually, I think I think arrays also can contain arrays because it could be unnamed all the way down. Uh, but yeah, so this object that I show here is equivalent to a list, A equals one, B equals list, one comma two. All right, and then other than that, we, we've parsed uh, JSON many times in previous chapters, so I'm not gonna dig into how to parse it. But let's start getting into some of those other types. So XML, uh, it stands for extensible markup language. Um, again, formally, that should be application slash XML or text slash XML or uh, various other things slash XML. This is one that XML was created as kind of a generic language that other languages could be built from. And so you'll see a lot of things that that reference XML in their uh, mind type. And often if it references XML, then it can be parsed as if it is XML, native XML. Hitter2 REST body uh, XML uses XML2 read XML under the hood. Um, and I'm going to show it a little bit, uh, but we're going to go into this a lot more in um, a couple of chapters in the RVS chapter. So um, XML data, sorry. Uh, the, the general idea of XML is you have tags in these angle brackets. And so you have you know the name of the tag. It can have one or more uh, attributes, but it doesn't have to. And then the close of the angle. And then whatever is inside of the tag, and then the same tag with just a slash and the repeated tag name. So the you know open tag name and close tag name are wrapped around whatever the content is. Um, it can be nested quite a bit, <laughs> um, but the idea is that because this tag name can be everything within certain rules of what you know the formatting can be, like you can't have a space in it because space tells you that you're going into an attribute. Um, other than those slight limitations, it can be just about anything. And so the idea is you can make any language out of this. Uh, they made this after XML, or I'm sorry, after HTML, but HTML is a type of XML at, in that case because it uses the same format. 
some example XML, you can get this in hitter two uh, with um, example URL. It, example URL is a uh, function that's built into hitter two to let you set up some, some examples. And in this case, if you give it slash XML, it will uh, produce this XML. Now I'm parsing this with rec rest body string because again, that gives you just the pure raw text that is in that response body. Um, and you can see some XML here. Uh, it, get, it tells you that this is XML, what the encoding is uh, usefully. And then it tells you, or it has this structure. Now this is printing with this structure. Um, XML doesn't have to have the indentations, but uh, this example one does just so it's easier to read. Um, so we've got root at the top and slash root at the end. And then inside of that tag, there's this address tag. And inside of address, there's a city, the postal code, uh, state, street address. Um, some other interesting things to note here is, you know, I showed you that format, but technically you can close out a tag with just a slash at the end. So that's what's going on here with children because it doesn't have anything inside of children. It's just telling you this is the children tag, but it's an empty list. Um, and then another piece is here we have an empty spouse list, but it has an attribute of null equals true. Uh, that's just an example of the type of thing that you could have in XML. And if we actually parse this, um, it parses as a special content type, XML document um, and XML node. This is like the XML2 class that can be used for, for more things within that, that package. Um, like I said, we will see a lot more of this in the RVS chapter, but just to get kind of the basic look at this, XML2 does have an as list function. So you can take that extracted XML and turn it just raw into a list. Uh, and you can see it kind of has the structure you would kind of naturally expect from what we saw that it, it is a list with the top element is named root. And then, you know, because the top element here is named root, inside of that, there's address, age, um, et cetera. Um, I'll answer that comment in the chat in a second. Uh, some things to see is children, you know, it's an empty list. Like we saw here, that children is an empty list. And then spouse is also an empty list and it gets a R uh, attribute of null, which is the character true, um, because that's what we had here. Um, XML lingo, there is a lot that becomes, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about it a lot more in the RVS chapter, but there's um, tags. Tags are, so let's go back to this. Um, these are tags. So all the things that are like the top, the named pieces. Um, uh, elements, we'll, we'll talk about um, elements are like types of tag or parts, parts of tags. Like, so technically address is an element of root, but it's also a tag. Um, Attributes are uh, things like, you know, anything that has a name with equals. Um, so yeah, those are the, the three main pieces. So there's the tag. Um, and then this is just the content of that tag or element um, or node also, because we see XML node, that just means, you know, this is a node and then this is a node inside of that node. And if we go back, address actually has nodes inside of that node. Um, much more to come on all of this. HTML, hypertext markup language, like I said, it actually came before XML. It was like the first language of the web. Uh, but then XML was developed to contain it, uh, to make HTML as a subtype of XML. Um, so HTML is XML with specific defined tags. You'll see it as that, like technically it's supposed to be text slash HTML, but um, you will see application slash slash X HTML plus XML. So it's saying it's a type of XML. Um, again, this was kind of like a big deal for a while. It's, oh, we're gonna formally redefine HTML as XML as a type of XML, but um, that kind of rolled back. Uh, people aren't as, as picky about that. Um, you can use rest body HTML for uh, HTML content, and that uses XML to read HTML under the hood. Uh, 
but read HTML is actually read XML with this as HTML equals true flag, um, which means it looks for some specific tags, but then it also is a little loose about some things that HTML did before XML came along. Um, for the most part, again, you can just use rest body HTML and that'll deal with it. And then you will have to parse it because the object that it comes out with probably isn't going to be ready for what you need to do. And we'll see so very much more about that in the RVEST chapter. Um, RVEST, I guess I've mentioned it a few times. So RVEST is the package for just scraping stuff off the web that isn't actually served by an API. It's just scraping a web page. Uh, so maybe you want to get a series of tables out of a Wikipedia page, for example. Um, and it will, it turn it does, you know, exactly this. It's actually using, uh, currently uses hitter under the hood and it's, it does that call and does rest body H or the equivalent of rest body HTML. And it's just giving you the, uh, parsed HTML, um, into that, into an object that you can then work with from there. Um, but it lets you find the specific elements within the page that you want to use again, much more to come. Um, all right. And, and I guess I'll, I'll give you guys a moment to, uh, let me know how was, how is that level? Do you want more depth? I, I, I admit more examples for sure. And I need to get that in here. I don't have them yet. Uh, but other than that, um, kind of the, the overview of how it works, how did that feel? If you have any comments. Yeah. I mean, I, I like the, the mapping to our objects, um, and like the, the fundamental like values and how those map, um, that was helpful. I, I was feeling like I wanted more on like the overall structure of each, like, like kind of the global structure of like JSON, for instance, um, like what that looks like before going into the particular, uh, is that where you talked about like, um, sorry, I don't remember all the slides, but right where you talked about the atomic or the different types, um, the right. scalar types, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so yeah, this part is like it belongs when I first introduced JSON, probably. Um, and so it doesn't really fit here. Like we had talked about JSON a little bit before, and I think I just need to combine those things to make uh, it make more sense. I think okay. So you, so they people will already know what the I think yeah structure is and yeah. So I, yeah, I need to reconcile that for sure though. Th this one is definitely gonna have a lot of tables, I think this chapter um, and, and kind of a, once I do one of them, they'll all be basically the same because it's, here's this markup, here's the basic idea of it. But part of it is, you know, I'm not gonna make you an expert in JSON and I'm not gonna make you an expert in XML. I'm gonna tell you, this is what it looks like. This is how you know you have it. And this is what you use to get it into an R format. And then once it's in the R format, you don't have to worry about it as much. Um, and yeah, link it, I think as Jim said, kind of link out to the formal definitions for people who want a lot more detail. Um, part of the problem here is we haven't gotten to yet, like XML and HTML both are, we're gonna get a lot more into them in the RVEST chapter, uh, which is, I don't know, maybe a, Maybe I should do our vest before this one. Um, and then it wouldn't be as hard because all that would be left is the binary stuff at this point. That might make more sense, actually. I will make a note of that. All right. Yeah. Um, in general, yeah, like XML is kind of scary to me and I've worked with it a little bit, but I don't know. Like it, it always seems like a, a weird monster I can never grapple really, really tame. <laughs> um, and like you, there's all these, especially there are these libraries to like query an XML, uh, like, like to go from this node to that node and like to, and then filter on attributes. And there's a whole like language, I think for that kind of syntax. And there are two of two languages actually. Two of them. <laughs> and it's just, I was like, what yeah. is this evil syntax? You know? So yeah, we're not going to get all the way through uh, all the details of that, but I want to give you enough to recognize it and to answer. Um, I don't, I wouldn't agree with that, that 
uh, so Jim said, you know, why our best API is future, our best is past. There will always be web pages. Well, I can't say always, but whatever. There are web pages that aren't uh, necessarily intended to be used as a source of data, but, um, you know, maybe you are using uh, your school's calendar that doesn't have a, an API, but you want to be able to get all the data off of it or, um, you know, et cetera, any, anything that there might be that there, there are always web pages that are just intended to be read by humans underneath. Um, there is a, there might be an API, but there isn't. And, and this book is all about how to get uh, data off of the web uh, into R. And so, I mean, um, to answer the question of, isn't Harvest covered elsewhere? T technically, everything in this book is covered somewhere other than the stuff that the packages that I'm writing. Um, but it, it's putting it all together in one place. So if you want to get internet or information off the internet, this is going to be the place that covers it. Um, I will definitely be sending you off to some places for more information on not so much more on Arvest, but more on the languages that are used for uh, navigating XML responses to, to or HTML responses. Um, but I think we can get some really useful information that way. And this, we'll see, because this is a chapter that I have had in the book and then I removed from the book and then I'm putting back into the book. And I think I've done that a few times. I think it does fit. Um, there was one point, at, at one point I almost split it into two chapters and no, that's too much. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, I mean, I, I don't know. I guess I just answered that question, Jim. That it, the zeroth day is when I added our vest, and then I took it out, and then I put it back in, and then took it out. Um. So. All right. Uh All right. So. Probably what I will do is have the chapter that is kind of about, um. You know, getting text that isn't coming back as through an API slash, I guess it's a little bit about, um, it's not necessarily an Arvest chapter. So Arvest will get you um, this, like, uh, or objects like this, uh, extract it, rest body XML, rest XML. So it it gives you this, gives you this, this extracted XML object, or you can just use hitter two and get that same XML object. Um, and then from there, parsing it is the interesting part. And technically Arvest has um, some functionality to help with that, but to a large degree, it's not necessarily that we're really talking about Arvest, it's that we're talking about the thing that Arvest uh, exists to help you solve, which is parsing HTML and XML uh, responses. Arvest abstracts away all the idea that you're doing a get request and getting text and then parsing that text, but you are doing that. Under the hood, it's still a get request. Um, it's just that we do get requests all the time on the web. Uh, that you know, That's how you view a web page. All right. So yeah, so we'll have, it'll be in a couple of chapters, but we will have, I think, have already done this part <laughs> in the final version of the book. All right. So the, the parts that we don't have definitely haven't done are binary objects and errors. And so binary objects, this is where things get a little hacky um, because there isn't a single easy answer to what you do with binary objects because binary objects basically means everything else. Uh, so there are mime, type, mime types of image slash something that can be ping, JPEG, SVG plus XML, uh, TIFF, uh, all the other image formats could be there. Um, there's audio slash um, <laughs> yes. So yes, <laughs> that um, if you do, if you're trying to do uh, an API call um, and you screw it up, sometimes you'll get back a response, you know, a web page because it's what you get to when you're not logged in to that API. So yes, absolutely. That is uh, API calls are uh, 
API calls en encompass all of the get or the type of requests, types of requests, and viewing a web page is just get. Uh, it's a subset of API calls, really. And then it has an interpreter on top of the API call. All right, so audio, there's MPEG, WAV, OGG, a whole bunch of different formats. And something you will see is audio and video overlap a lot on the available formats because like in order to have video, you, you have audio inside of it. So uh, MPEG or MP4 is a video format and, and MPEG is an audio format. MP3 is the uh, audio specific version of that format. Um, you have OGG again, which is a video and audio format. Lots of different things. You, know, you, you might see different things. Um, we're going to talk about this, why there's a question mark here, because AV is kind of the best package I've found for dealing with these things. But I also have some things that I feel like are pretty basic that I haven't found a package that can do it. Um, and then the the final fall through is just application slash star. Um, octet stream is just, uh, that just means, hey, this is binary data. It doesn't have its own MIME type deal with it and so that you will see this sometimes um you know if you're downloading some specific file type that has to do with whatever the product is that you're dealing with it might come back as just an octet stream um, but also you can have an application slash uh x hyphen bzip so that's for bzipped files or pdf is an application slash PDF's a special case because sometimes that acts as an image. If it's a P, you know, one page PDF that just has an image in it, um, sometimes it acts as uh, text or data. Um, we'll, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to deal with that. Um, like, like I said before, even more so here, each one of these cases could be a book, like how to process images uh, is definitely, you know, there are many books about that, but we're, we're gonna get kind of the basics of how to deal with it and then hopefully point you in the right direction in case you have things that you ever want to do with them. So um, the first thing you do with any of these is you do resp body raw that will get the raw content out of the response. And then for example, uh, here I'm doing ma uh, the magic package. It's all about dealing with images um, and it has image read. That This is useful to know that if you look at this function, it, the first argument is path. And um, you know it makes it sound like, oh, you have to have it a file name that you're giving it, but you can give it the actual like binary representation of the image and it'll know how to parse it properly. Um, what this does, so at this point, what we will have is we'll have the image as an object in R, it'll show up in the viewer in our studio and you can manipulate it from there. You could maybe save it, you could uh, edit it, you can do whatever you want to do. Maybe it, it, you know, you want to treat it as data and you want to get all the pixel, uh, all the color ratios and all that. You can do that with magic at that point. Um, magic also has a special reader for SVGs. It requires that you have the RSVG package installed, but then once it does this step, it just treats the SVG like any other image. Until you, you know, if you want to save it, you can save it as an SVG, you can save it as a ping, you can save it as whatever. Um, and then again, they have another one for, that requires PDF tools where you can treat a PDF like an image and it'll take um, the first image out of that PDF and then treat it like an image like any of these other uh, functions. Beyond this, what you do with those images at that point, there are um, all kinds of different things. At, at the end of this section, I'm going to talk about just, you know, generically how to deal with uh, the file side of things. But Magic uh, is a large package, and you can do all kinds of editing of the image at that point. Um, also, separately, PDF Tools has other things if you want to deal with PDFs that aren't images. Um, you know, you can rest body raw and then process the PDF uh, beyond that. That uh, is a very complex topic. PDFs are a very ubiquitous um, file format, but they are like they are designed for layout. They're not designed for data and getting data back out of a PDF can be very painful. Um, so I'm not planning to go into a lot of detail about that here. I will have some um, links out to how to deal with PDFs. I 
Uh, it's painful. I had a PDF that I was trying to pull data out of for a Tidy Tuesday, and I actually wrote a package for it because none of the packages that I could find did what I needed. And it felt like it should be simple, but just getting data out of a table. Um, there's one that uses Java, but anyway, it's a whole thing. And so I will link out to those things, but I'm not going to uh, explain in depth how to deal with PDFs. Uh, videos. So, you know, as I saw, like here, we're, we're loading this into R and then we can manipulate it. We can do other things and then save it. Um, as far as I've ever been able to find so far for videos, there isn't, and, and for audio, there's nothing to do that. You have to save it out to a file and then you can load that file back into R to do different things. Um, AV is the kind of best candidate I found for a package for doing this, where you can take that thing that you just saved, you can convert it to a different format. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit more too, but um, you know, it, you you can do some editing it with it uh, of it with AV, but actually. Even this package that, you know, this is the hackiest hack that I'm going to have here. And we'll see whether exactly this format makes it into the book, but for parsing the YouTube videos, like this one that we are recording right now, the automatic parsing that I do, I actually use something more like this where um, I save it out to a path and then, you know, pull out different properties of it and use this FFmpeg system um, application, uh, make the command for that, and then just run that command with the system command in R. Um, because I haven't found a package, even though AV like wraps FFmpeg, um, I haven't found anything that lets you do all the things that FFmpeg can do, which is, I don't know, surprising to me. Um, so if you're working with images or with videos, what this all amounts to is you're gonna have to save it and then find what you need, you know, what you're able to do beyond that. Um, I do recommend FFmpeg, and again, I'll have links out in the book uh, to, and eventually on these slides, uh, to help about that. And who knows, maybe I can either find or create a package that wraps that a little better, because um, this is really hacky right now. Um, if you have worked with videos, I would love to hear about it. So both you know the two of you and anyone else uh, watching this, um, but hopefully this will get you pointed in the right direction if you have video. Similarly for audio, uh, you, again you got to write that file, um, and I need to change that to path because I say path here. The argument in um, AV audio convert convert as path. It has a lot more um, ability, like a lot. It covers a lot more of the things that you can do to audio, but it still isn't everything and um you know if you want to do more manipulation of audio unfortunately there isn't there isn't anything i know of now you know i'm not an audio expert i'm sure there are things that people do if they're trying to parse audio as data um av does let you do a little bit with like turning uh an audio track into a spectrogram and going from there uh getting the peaks and valleys and all that of the audio but um i don't know past that and then the final thing is just anything else, raw data. Um, anything else, you have to do that same thing. You have to write it out to a binary. Uh, so get the raw and then write bin and that can write it to a file. And then you can do whatever from there. Uh, I just want to point out that, you know, if you're getting some weird random file uh, or some random binary and it's not an image and it's not audio and it's not video, um, be sure you know what it is and that you, uh, you know, it's a trusted source and you you know what you're trying to save it as because that feels just like a bad idea if you don't know what it is. So uh, work with it from there. And then the final piece on this that um, came up kind of, you know, related to what Kevin said in the chat, um, open AI in the API, one of the options for when you generate images is that it can send it back as base64 and yeah encoded JSON data. Base64 is a fairly old technology. Um, I can remember early internet, you would have like text forums and they would have uh, files base64 encoded where it's just the text 
is a file. And so that would be like, there would be images embedded in posts as base64 encoded. Um, it's a way to transform binary data into text. Uh, it takes six bit blocks of data and then translates each of those six bits into one or that block of six bits into one of 64 characters. That's because 64 is two to the sixth. And so it can cover that many bits of binary information. You don't need to know all that detail, but the point is that it uh, just takes some file, relatively small file usually, and turns it into text. Um, so to do that, to parse, process that, you need to first process it as JSON, rest body JSON and, on your response. Find the exact element that you're looking for. So this, the B64 JSON uh, within is technically, I think, within data within rest body JSON. You know, you'll have to parse out whatever piece it is. Um, and then JSON Lite has base64 deck, base64 decode uh, built in that you can use to, to get this out. And then at this point, this is raw data, just like we've seen on the other slides. You could write that out as a file. You can use Im uh, image read from magic to read it in as um, an R object. You can do whatever it is that you want to do with it at that point. That's how you uh, translate it. And then um, we'll possibly look at this in uh, an upcoming chapter, but if you were sending an image back up to the OpenAI API, for example, you would use Base64 Enc uh, for encode to turn it into text to send back. Um, I think the reason they do this is because uh, it sends other information in this JSON. It tells you like the date that it was generated, and I think it gives you a URL where the image is stored, and it gives you some things like that. Um, might send back the prompt. Um, and so they, they do this so it can all be in the simple JSON format, but it's, I don't know, it's a little weird <laughs> that they, they uh, encode it. Most things where I've worked with images just have the image as raw uh, content within the body. All right. Um, and let's try. Um, it's larger than raw. So if you're encoding in text, this is a pretty um, messy way to encode data. I, I think you're taking these six bits and turning them into an eight bit byte or or possibly more than eight bits, depending on the file system or the, the character system that you're using. So you're making it bigger. Uh, so it's, it's the opposite of compressing it. <laughs> um, so there's that, but a lot, like a lot of systems can deal with text that can't deal with binary. And so it's kind of, um, I think it's because they want it to be uh, easy for any system. Like any system can get that image, even if they can't parse it. Uh, and the default way that they send the image back actually is as a link uh, that you then go download through some other means. Um, you have to authenticate with it and there's a whole thing there, but um, they, I think they want to keep everything to pure text is the idea. And actually saying that, I'll bet that they think of it as, uh, base 64 encoded because then it's text and they can work with it that way in, on their, or inside their model. I don't know for sure, but I uh, wouldn't be surprised if it's something like that. All right. One, uh, okay, that's there, one go. question. Sorry. Uh, yep easier to just talk um <laughs> this open ai example like i get the point of what you're saying about having other attributes in there um like the url and things like that but there's no way of including that in like a different part of the response or something uh so there there is i know you can in a body that you send so it must be possible in a body you receive but i i rarely if ever see where you, it can be a multi-part body um, I, I don't have any examples of that. So I'll see if I put that into the next iteration, but in theory, you can send back, uh, basically a form that has text and binary pieces. Um, I don't have an example of that. Um, and I don't know if hitter two can just parse those natively or what it does often mm -hmm. with that. Cause it can create them. So it must be able to parse them. 
Yeah, um, it feels like it feels like a weird. I don't know that much about this, obviously, yeah. but it's like a weird compromise where yeah. both types are possible, but then you can't do them. I don't know. You're like, I'm going to do this weird format for the t- this huge <laughs> image, you know? Uh, yeah. And have this other stuff there. And so I think part of it is on images, it doesn't make that much of a difference because they're not like truly gigantic files. Um, and storage and uh, bandwidth are big enough now that the difference isn't that big of a deal, I, I think, is what they're going with there. Um, and also, like I said, I wouldn't be surprised if the models are working with uh, 64 encoded binary data. Um, I'm not sure how that would work, but I could imagine that being something they're doing since they're doing the text and image models uh, mixed together. All right, I do want to try to get through the error sections. It's not that long, and then we can have this uh, knocked out. So to back up a little bit, we haven't technically talked about um, when we make a request, the response that come back, comes back comes with a status code. Um, we have had, uh, we've only dealt with these uh, 200, uh, like exactly 200 is just a normal success. There are other things in the 200 block that are just different like types of success. Um, for the most part, 200s you're gonna deal with using the RESP functions. The, the ones that we've seen so far. The other um, status codes, uh, the 100 range is information that's that's all handled by curl under the hood, like before hitter two uh, sees the data. And so those we don't really have to worry about um, for our purposes. 300s are about redirection. It's saying you should go look here instead. Uh, curl, unless you tell it not to, is going to auto follow those redirections. So the response will come back saying, oh no, the thing you're looking for isn't here, it's it's at this URL and curl will just make another request and send it, go out to that. Um, and so we don't deal with those either. 400s and 500s, those are our errors. So 400 block means client error, uh, it's your fault, but uh, you know it might not really be your fault. It could be something parsed weird on the server side or, or just a transient thing, but they think that it's your fault. Uh, I'll talk about an example of that in a minute. Um, 500s are supposed to be server error. So that is their fault. So they're saying, you know, um, this resource isn't available right now, for example. There are like a whole bunch of uh, very specific numbered um, meanings. Like the most famous one probably is 404, uh, not found. Uh, for the client error. So that's saying that you put in a URL, but it's a page that doesn't exist. And again, well, is that your fault or is that their fault? Hard to say. Um, but there are all these very specific things. And right now, like everything we've done, um, hitter two is treating all of these as just error. And it throws an error in the R console and it says hitter two encountered an error. It doesn't give you any details. Um, and that can be really, really annoying. Uh, especially because usually, like these are coming in back with all these very fine grained status codes. Often there's a message involved and we're just seeing, oh, there was an error. So there's this function rec error. Uh, rec error, uh, you take a request before you do rec perform or rec perform iterative and you give it um, these two arguments or one or both of these two arguments in, in addition to the rec. So is error is a function to identify errors. So again, this is like we've seen a few times here where it's, you're sending it a function, not a call to a function. So you give it the name of the function that is going to uh, take the response that comes back, parse the response and say, uh, return either true or false, is this an error? Um, we'll see use cases for that in a minute. And then the other argument is body. Again, it's a function that takes the response and it and returns a, an error message or, or a message that will be added to the error that hitter uh, returns. So it, it's, okay, I'm saying this is an error, but I want you to tell me a little bit more about it. The three most common use cases um, would be, number one, if you just want to deal with the errors yourself, you want to get the responses back and then parse them, you don't want hitter two to do anything, um, you can just send this is error function as just false, like a, a function that always returns false. And so no matter what comes back from uh, the API, 
hitter two is not going to do anything about it. It's going to record that as a response. It's going to give you that response um, and treat it just like a successful response. Um, and, you know, this would be <clears throat> possibly uh, like in the context of a package, you might want to just completely parse out the errors yourself. Um, especially, we'll talk about a little bit that, you know, sometimes the um, server might just be bad and like give you 404s, but then it gives you the actual object within the, the 404 response and it's not actual 404, different things like that. And so if you have an API that's just kind of weird, you might have to deal with this kind of thing. Uh, the next one is, you know, let's say, uh, for example, the API does something special with all the 400s. It uses 400s to mean uh, you're not logged in, but we still give you information or something like that. Uh, but all the 500s are real. They're saying something's broken on the server side. Well, you could say uh, my is error function is if hitter two resp status on the resp returns 500 or higher. So resp status is going to just give you that code that comes back uh, with the response. That's the second most common use case. And then the third one, like I can't think of a reason. Well, okay, other than having to know what's coming back, but you should always try to find a way to do this one is where you just take that body piece, this argument, and parse out whatever error message is coming uh, from that response and return that to hitter two. Now, the reason this isn't automatic is they can put it in all kinds of different places within that object. So you'll have to get one of these. You'll have to like do this to get the object. I'm oh, sorry, I wasn't pointing at it. Do this one to, to get that error object and see what it's going to look like or read the documentation, um, and then learn how to parse out that error message that it's sending you. And then, I mean, I um, plan to write a function to make it easier to do this. Uh, if you have the um, open AI or open API specifications for the for this API, because this would be nice to always have so that if they are giving you information about what the error is, let's give that to the user um, or to you. Know, to you so. That's a very, very common use case, I think. Um, definitely to do on this, by the way, is I need examples of these. I don't have them yet, but I will have them on the next iteration through this chapter for sure. Uh, so the next part of this is just a, a note about pagination. So we did um, rec perform iterative before, and it has an argument on error that can either be stop or return. By default, it's stop, um, but you can also give it this argument return. Importantly, this is an R error. So if you're iterating through the, the multiple function or multiple API calls and you get an error in one of those calls, an R error, stop means throw the error anytime, if, if any call within that stack throws an R error. Just stop what you're doing, throw the error, Versus return means you still stop iterating, but you turn return everything that you've gotten so far. And so you don't throw an error, you throw a, uh, I think it throws a warning and returns the object. That is you know, related, but separate. Because if you do like is error equals false, then that wouldn't trigger because you never get an R error. You would just be getting a HTTP error, like the, the server, the API is giving you an error, but it's not coming out as an R error. Um, that means there's a lot to think about here for whatever your specific use case is of maybe you want to keep iterating. Um, you know, if one page gives you a 404, you still want to go on to the next page maybe. And so you'll have to think about uh, your exact use case when you are paginating. Um, if, if it's not working, if you're getting weird errors or, and weird stoppages and things like that, you, oops, sorry, you might want to combine these. So do a rec error and or on error equals return um, and decide how that works for your specific use case. Um, I can't give you more than that because like, I don't have an example where this comes up because I don't have a good failing example. And that's what this is, is something is broken in the API, but APIs are often, or 
it's it's not out of the question for an API to have something weird in it. And so if you have that weird thing, just know that this combination might come into play. And again, I hope to have one of these uh, in the next pass through here. I have had um, lots of APIs where I have dealt with weird things. And uh, you know, the unfortunate thing is at this point, like, okay, I need to go back and make a whole bunch of API calls and see how did I deal with those things in the past? Uh, maybe probably search through some of my code for rec error to figure out where I've had to deal with this because um, it's definitely something that comes up. And when you see these errors coming back, you, you have these different tools for dealing with it. And then related to that, um, <laughs> there you go, Kevin, um, <laughs> that the next level on this is retries. So we talked very briefly in the pagination section about rec retry. We just turned it on. I, the example I gave is always setting like max tries to three. And so that would, if it gives a proper um, retry signal uh, on your in your pagination, it would give it a couple more tries before it gives up on that one. That's what rec retry is going to do if all we do is set max retries is three. Um, but this also has, let me page in, this is transient argument is, again, a function to decide whether to retry given the RESP. So that one will return true or false. You take It takes in the RESP and you parse it and say whether to return. Um, the LinkedIn API, I have worked with somewhat and it will throw, I think it's a 404 um, sometimes on some of your calls. And then the next time you make exactly the same call, it's like, oops, I didn't mean that. And sends you the actual result. And so I use rec retry in that case that I, I say 404 is transient, try it twice or maybe three times. So I don't remember what I do, but you know, try it multiple times because that 404 might be a lie basically, which is annoying, but it's something you have to deal with it sometimes. Um, related to that, there is this back off, back off argument. It again is a function that takes the number of tries that have happened so far um, and outputs a um, amount to wait, a, a, an amount of time that it should wait. Again, this is an optional argument and probably you don't wanna mess with this, but you can, if you um, have a specific API, you know, like in that case, it, it actually could be that, well, if, if I've called it once, try again right away. And if that still doesn't work, you know, give it five seconds because it's processing something or something like that. Um, and so that would be, where you take this and, and do something a little bit more complicated. Um, and yes, it can be nonlinear. Well, yeah, it can totally be nonlinear. It is using the number of tries um, in this case. So it's it, it would be related to the number of tries, but it doesn't have to be linearly related. But then the other way it can work is there's this after argument, which you generally would wanna use either back off or after. And after takes the response object itself and returns number of uh, seconds that it should wait. So maybe if it's a 404, yeah. So yeah, back off is a function and then after is also a function. Um, so maybe you wanna say uh, you'll have different types of transient and you you say, oh, if it's a 404, wait five seconds. If it's a um, you know uh, uh, retry error and it tells you how long to wait, wait that number of seconds. And so you can use the two of those to, to wait different amounts of time, uh, depending on the response. Again, I haven't had a case where I cared <laughs> enough to get that detailed on it. You know, usually it's it'll work on the second try um, in most cases that I've tried. And so I don't uh, need to bother, but you know, especially if it's charging you for each call, you might wanna do something a little bit more uh, complicated to determine when to try again. Um, right, so by default, so it's a 403, I think, is the, the error code that will tell you how long to wait. And if you don't, if you just give this a max tries or max seconds, it uses that information if, if the API is sending it back to you properly. Um, but there are many APIs that don't, either don't tell you or they don't tell you in the standard way. And so you'll have to look at the object and say, oh, they have this 
information buried way down in the data about how long I should wait. And so that might be an example where you want to use uh, after to pull out the response and, and figure out how long to wait. There's also um, a rec throttle function. I don't go into that because uh, if you're doing these things right, you should never need rec throttle. Rec throttle is just basically um, slow things down if I'm making too many calls. Uh, but all these other things together, I don't think I, I, I don't have a good use case for rec throttle, but that does exist if you want to go read that documentation. All right. And that is, you know, a little bit, almost 10 minutes over time. So um, I have, you know, a pause here for any questions. That's the end. There's no more content. Um, I would say I, I need to um, get going. So if you do have any questions, go ahead and ask them on Slack. And I will see all of you uh, in two weeks. Sorry for the abrupt cutoff. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you for being here. This was really good. This was very helpful. For, uh, I hope for you, it was very helpful for me. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> all right, bye.